Hi everyone, uh, we are live. Um, welcome to our online bourbon and uh, rye tasting. Um, I am just trying to check to make sure everyone's online. So as you guys are coming in, if you can just um, obviously comment and just say hi, just so I know everyone's coming in okay. Uh, and I will be just checking our social media just to make sure that no one's lost. I know we made sort of a, a last minute decision this morning just to go on YouTube via or rather than Facebook. Um, that was just to suit a few uh, customers. Um, but I will just leave you here in the holding room. Um, like I said, when you're coming in, just say hi and just uh, just want to know the chat's working. Um, and then I'll be back on in a sec once I've just been out and uh, found people. Uh, great. Thanks, Al. Yeah, and Neil. Appreciate that. Uh, and I'll see you guys in a sec. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> um, just obviously, I'm just, I'm just posting the, the link on all our pages just to again make sure that everyone's here. Uh, I see everyone: Tim, Matthew, Michael, uh, Keely, Brian, Terence, Matthew Bellhead here, mate. Uh, Adam Morris, Patrick. Uh, we've got Matthew, Adam. Great. Happy Fourth of July. Yes. Yeah. Well done, Adam. Um, so welcome all. Um, and like I said, yeah, last minute change to go to YouTube. It's just to suit a few of our, our regulars that may struggle with, with Facebook. Um, and yeah, welcome to the bourbon and rye uh, tasting. Um, I think we've, I don't know if this is our first one actually, or we've done a bourbon before. I just can't remember. <laughs> so um, we thought we'd obviously suit this to the 4th of July just to coincide with uh, American Independence Day. Uh, and what better option to go with uh, other than bourbon and rye? Um, we obviously have a special guest and I'll leave just uh, to introduce him in a sec. Um, uh, general housekeeping, if anything, like I said, if anything goes down, just keep refreshing and I'll go live again uh, via YouTube. Uh, if anything happens to um, Jas or our guests, again, we'll just, um, I'll, I'll come in and just fill some time while I get those sorted and, and get them back online. Uh, but touch wood, we, we had a good session yesterday. I'm hoping today is gonna be the same. Um, and what else? So uh, got the, the current ones that are on the uh, the other tastings that are on the market at the moment. So we have the uh, obviously you guys here like your bourbon and whiskey. So we do have the Glen Goyne one uh, coming up next week, um, and then we have Amroot at the end of July. Uh, Glen Goyne is looking to be a really good one as well. So if you haven't got your tickets for that yet, um, I will post actually. I'll post the links at the end again in the comments. Um, and then, um, but you should have emails with, with the links on as well. And through our social media, Facebook, and Instagram, I've got the links on for that as well. Um, and then we do also have that gin tasting for any gin fans there, which is uh, next week also, which is taking a look at Swedish gin and the Lakes Distillery uh, a little bit closer to home. Um, and then we've got, um, I know we mentioned it yesterday, which is the cigar and um, it's cognac whiskey and cigar tasting um so that will go live uh, tomorrow for tickets uh, and then we're also going to do a quite a different style cocktail tasting where you will actually get the ready-made cocktail through all you have to do is um stir over ice um shake whichever one we decide to do and that's again looking at varied spirits so it's not going to be one particular spirit on that one we're going to be looking at uh vodka uh bourbon whiskey and i think one other um and they're nice easy ready to uh, ready made in a sachet pour over ice and then we'll go through and there'll be pacific spirits used with that as well so it, again it's a talking point uh, and look out for that one that'll be released um on monday onwards uh but without further ado i will bring jas in um and then we'll get going 
and I'll even do all the instructions. So let's bring Jess in. Hello, Jess. Hey, how are you doing? Yeah, good. Yeah. Day. Yep, recovered from yesterday. <laughs> recovered from yesterday, the gin. Oh, yeah. yeah. Was that, actually, funny yeah. enough, they were actually quite high percentages. We, we, I didn't think about it until after. They were 45 to 47 and above, so it was, um, yeah, nice. Yeah. Well. Generally, uh, American a bit stronger. All, American spirits generally are bit stronger no, that's true yeah actually yeah because even with even with these bourbons here they're a little bit higher in percentage okay so uh, it looks like everyone's um in because i think we've got a few watching for the same as well so i've taken that into account so um i think i will leave you to it and we'll uh, go from there hey guys um welcome nice to see you all uh all the adams uh here today michael uh <laughs> We've got we've got Adam Morris as well, and uh, Luke and Hannah. Thanks for joining us again, um, grooms. All welcome, and uh, and we've got some of the Lightbox friends as well. It's Patrick and, and the team. So um, welcome, and thanks for supporting the tasting tonight. Um, but guys, it's July the fourth. It's American uh, whiskies. Tonight, uh, we did American gins last night, so um, getting a bit confused. American whiskey tonight. Um, got some great bourbons and rice um, put together for you. And uh, we are joined tonight um, by one of our guests, so brand new to us. Uh, his name is Michaela, um, and he's from. He's a brand ambassador for, for the whiskies that we're going to be trying tonight. So um, anything there is to know about this stuff, he, he's the man that's going to know. Um, you've also got your ginger ale, which we've put in with your pack and some chocolate. Um, so we're going to use those uh, as we go through the tasting as well. So as usual, put your feedback in, send us your comments. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, Michael, absolutely, gin is still in my system. Um, <laughs> and so, um, yeah, let us know what you think of each of the ones as we go through. Um, we obviously tried a rye gin yesterday. But uh, we're going to try this whiskey today, which is kind of what it's what it's meant to be for. Uh, so let's bring Michaela in. Uh, everyone can say hello to him, and he will take us through. Hey, how you doing? Hey guys, welcome. Uh, thank you for for having me. Um, very good. Cool. You doing uh, good? You okay? Yeah, very good indeed. And uh, you know what a special day as well. The bar are reopening in London. It's the fourth of July. Exactly. And, uh, yeah, we definitely. I definitely need a drink as well. So yeah, yeah, to share with you guys. <laughs> yeah. So look, I'm gonna um, let you take over uh, and run for each of the brands. Um, guys, your pouches one, two, three, and four. Uh, the order that we're gonna go through is the American bourbon. Then we're going on to the rye. Then we're going on to the Yellowstone. And then we're finishing off with this little beauty here, a uh, minor case, which is also right. So that's our order, one, two, three, and four. And I'm going to hand over to Michaela, who's going to uh, take us through some amazing whiskies. Thank you. Um, so uh, the first thing that I suggest everyone to do is to just raise your glass, have a, a whiskey just to start with, even because I... I would like to talk a bit about the difference between, uh, uh, of course, all the different brands, but especially between a Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey and uh, uh, another whiskey up there. Uh, it's really different the way than uh, in America. They do it, respect the, the rest of the world. We know that. Um, I prepared some slides as well, just to go through as well some, uh, um, yeah, just to visualize as well why, why it's so different. Uh, in the meantime, I like to drink a neat. You got some ginger ale. I'm starting with that's a Brooks, and then uh, I will go back to it and just uh, uh, do a kind of flavor profile, even though it's uh, it's completely personal. You know, I would like you to to express yourself as well. I will just mention what for me uh, is the kind of spirit category and where I will put it as a category of bourbon. Um, but to to kind of you know divide that, we need to talk first of all. Uh, the difference between bourbon and other whiskey. I know that some of you already are bourbon lover. Uh, the main difference for me is you're kind of more free to express yourself. Um, 
for instance, if we're talking, if we compare it with a single mold, we know then uh, single mold needs to be done in the post uh needs to be 100% uh, malted barley. So in a way, it's like you have to follow that recipe and that style. And obviously, you know, the geographic region uh, help a lot on, uh, you know, the, the different in flavor and so on. But in bourbon, there are so many factors that can actually change the final product, uh, which in a way is fascinating in the other can be quite confusing. So uh, bourbon, first of all, um, it doesn't need to come from Kentucky. You can do bourbon everywhere you like in uh, in, in US, uh, which of course is uh, it's kind of have different climate, different uh, climate condition, different humidity, different terroir as well. And if we believe in terroir for grape, we should uh, believe in terroir as well for grain. Now, uh, corn, for instance, is a native crops from uh, Kentucky. Uh, it's not the same about rye, and rye used to be imported um, and, you know, bring to Kentucky usually by horse or by boat. Um, so you will see that in Kentucky there is a high content of corn in the recipe simply because it was there. Uh, and the fact that it wasn't imported like a, a, a malt, a malt, a barley from, uh, from Europe, from the first colony, it actually have a DNA structure in the plant and all the nutrients and the, the enzyme, you know, and, uh, and, and different factors that actually contribute to the flavor are actually on the soil. Um, so to talk about how you do bourbon, we know then is in US, you can use both way, post steel and column steel. Uh, today, actually, we're gonna try both profiles to see, you know, what a mess different between the two. Um, obviously, when you distill it with uh, a column steel, you can reach higher temperature, but in bourbon, you cannot Distill more than 80% ABV. So this is again is uh, something that is quite distinguishing from any other whiskey. If we're talking about single grain in Scotland, for instance, you can distill it way higher than 90%. Uh, that's we that's mean that you extract more ethanol, but you kind of leave behind a lot of flavor from the grain in a way. And uh, and by law, you can't do that in bourbon. So you can distill, of course, in the post steel, which is probably was the very first way to distill it. It's not as traditional today, just because bourbon, as we know, there is a messy consumption of bourbon. There are, uh, for what I know, there are four barrels of whiskey, American whiskey in aging for every American citizen. And uh, and that's kind of scary on one side, but you, you, you actually know what I mean. In uh, big production, it's, uh, it's kind of, you know, more traditional nowadays, even though we have two different distillers to talk about today. So we will see then uh, it's still craft, you know, whiskey still exists and it's still beautiful and and easy to enjoy and accessible. Um, in terms of uh, what we need to distill, you can distill four types of grain. So uh, the main, of course, is needs to be corn. In the case of bourbon, now we will talk about as well rye, which is probably was the first in America. Uh, but as long as you have 51% of corn, then you can use the rest to actually kind of balance it up the flavor and create the profile that you want. So when we're talking about the uh, you know bourbon as a recipe, we can't see bourbon as one flavor profile because it depends as well, you know, what you use in terms of those extra three grain and it changed completely the game. So uh, in the case of uh, as a Brooks, for instance, we have uh, 68% corn and uh, a 10% of rye in the mash bill with a 13% of malted barley. Now the rye is what um, distiller called the uh, flavor grain. So it's actually a big impact in the flavor because it's adding a bit of spiciness to it. Uh, it kind of gives you the warm on your chest, uh, you know, the Kentucky hug in a way. Uh, but it's even kind of tingling on the back of your tongue. Uh, personally, I kind of feel that. Um, and when we actually have a heavy rye bourbon, it means that it's quite more uh, fiery, quite more punchy. I personally like it. I think, you know, especially when you mix it with something, it kind of goes through, um, but it's not probably the easier one or the baby step on the on the bourbon. It's a bourbon category, the heavy rye for, for bourbon lover. That's for sure. Um, the opposite spectrum of the flavor, it will be when we substitute the rye with the wheat. And this is another recipe, a completely different profile of bourbon called the wheated bourbon. Uh, so wheat is actually the opposite effect. It's smoother, it's, uh, it's quite more silky, you got more dry fruits, and uh, it's almost transformed this vanilla in, uh, in honey and agave. Um, so in terms of, you know, the sweetness from the cask. 
uh, and probably is one of the easier um, and accessible, you know, on the palate kind of bourbon. Um, the the other one, which is the probably the one that we want to talk more about today, is the traditional Kentucky mash bill. So in that sense, you actually have a, a, a really good balance between a malted barley and a rye. And doing that, you have the spiciness, but still the corn is what is shining through, and you got the the kind of complexity of the corn with the sweetness from the cask coming through. So in this sense, when uh, the rye is not over 13%, we not really consider a heavy rye bourbon. It doesn't have wheat, so this one here is a traditional Kentucky mash bill. And I believe there is no more traditional um, you know, mash bill recipe and story behind bourbon than actually as a Brooks and, uh, and, and Yellowstone. Um, Simply because, well, Yellowstone, uh, for instance, we're talking about craft distillery. The guy behind is Stephen Beam. We will mention it with the, we, when we're gonna try the whiskey. Uh, but as a Brooks, he's probably the pioneer of uh, a whiskey in terms of uh, uh, before as a Brooks and Taylor, because they kind of go together. Um, whiskey didn't actually have kind of law put in place to make sure then the consumer had the right thing, the, you know, the, the, the real deal. Uh, there was back in the day such a thing as a um, well, like imitation whiskey. We have some recipe back in the day of uh, people in America then uh, try to imitate even Irish and Scotch whiskey. And so imitation whiskey of the American blend, uh, it was kind of uh, you you are still allowed with American blend to mix it with a neutral grain spirit, add colorant, uh, flavoring to it, and as long that is got the the smell and the taste and the look of a whiskey, you can still call it American blend as today. But, you know, Taylor and Brooks, they, as a Brooks, they put together uh, uh, a new law and they create what, you know, is called the Bottling Bond Act. So in the 1897, the Bottling Bond Act was the first law that actually guaranteed to the consumer to have standards on the production line. So uh, to call it, for instance, Bottling Bond, it needs to be at least four years old. It couldn't be no less or no more than 50% ABV. Uh, it needed to be um, bottled and aged in a, in a uh, bonded warehouse uh, in the distillery. Uh, and a lot of, you know, uh, kind of rule that you need to follow still to call it bottling bond. Now, this one here was the first rule in place to protect the consumer even before the, the Food Act, which it was actually kind of 20 years after. So you back in the day, you could still buy some uh, meat, then uh, it was off and probably, you know, start to ferment, but you you could, you know, uh, not go wrong with bottling bond whiskey. So uh, thanks to Ezra Brooks and Taylor, we actually have finally uh, a protection, let's say, and everyone needs to do it in the same style. Uh, and uh, bourbon itself doesn't allow anything else but water. Now, just after Brooks, we got the President Tuff then actually add quite more rule and actually divide the category in uh, uh, from the bottling bond, in bottling bond bourbon, in wheat whiskey, corn whiskey, um, and rye whiskey as well. So we need to consider, first of all, then uh, caramel and colorant are something that uh, uh, most of the people don't want to talk about in whiskey. I personally like to bring that, you know, elephant in the room simply because Bourbon as a category is the only one that doesn't allow that. So uh, when we're talking about uh, any other whiskey, really, and I represent even some Irish whiskey, you got some uh, type of caramel, which is only for the color, you know, not for the flavor, and for guarantee a consistency more for the consumer than for the master blender. Uh, that are allowed by law. Um, in some particular case, some whiskey are allowed to add even uh, uh, flavoring to it or artificial uh, yeah, sort of, you know, uh, linging or tanning or, you know, uh, if, where, wherever you like to actually make it taste and look uh, a bit better. Bourbon cannot buy law. So uh, that's kind of protect us in a way. But if you see a different shape of, uh, you know, of, of the liquid dreads of brook from one bottle to another, if it happens, rarely does. Uh, but that just means then, you know, it's, it's natural as it is. Um, we can't say the same for rye. Rye, for instance, is allowed to a 2% of, uh, uh, you know, adding colorant or, you know, whatever you, you prefer, flavoring and so. But straight rye, which is the one that we will talk about today, and then both straight, 
Straight is the word and prevent adding colorant or uh, flavoring to rye as well. So <clears throat> again, I don't want to go too much on the, uh, you know, on the, the law and how you actually kind of, uh, uh, you know, distinguish the whiskey, but it's really important to understand then uh, a bourbon whiskey is, you know, it's what it is. It's just pure grain, spirits, you know, uh, water and thyme with the oak. Um, rye whiskey sometimes cannot. Uh, straight rye, again, is, you know, as clean you can go. Uh, and, you know, we have the difference between, for instance, bourbon from Kentucky and another bourbon is, is, of course, you know, the fact that it's from Kentucky. So the climate, it have a different change. We are really hot summer and cold winter. Uh, the water is the limestone water. So it's filtered uh, through, you know, natural stone, <clears throat> which you actually make it less heavy in, uh, in iron. So you don't have metallic flavor and such. Uh, but especially when we see in the bottle, Kentucky straight bourbon, that means that it's at least four years old uh, and there's nothing else but water added to it. If we see the uh, just the word bourbon, it actually doesn't even uh, specify how old it is. So just to go in order, bourbon whiskey, as we mentioned, you know, it needs to be at least 51% uh, corn, needs to be distilled less than 80% uh, ABV, needs to go in a uh, brand new oak barrel and needs to be charged inside, and not more than 62.5. Uh, uh, but then once you follow all of that, even one day in that barrel, you can call it bourbon. Now, Kentucky bourbon is not enough still because it's mean that it's bourbon, you can't add anything else but water, it's made in Kentucky, but for only one year and one day by law. You can, you know, obviously age it for more, but that's the minimum. So Kentucky straight bourbon, when you find those, you know, three words together, that's when you know then the whiskey is at least four years and there is nothing else but water to it. And, you know, you can definitely see the difference because in Kentucky, as we said, you know, it's uh, Kentucky is just beautiful. Every time I go there, you know, I kind of breathe real fresh air, you know, eat real food. The corn in Kentucky actually tastes like corn. It doesn't taste like, you know, supermarket corn. They have about 62 different flavor of corn, you know, and 32 different color. It's crazy. Um, but, you know, something that is beautiful is the way then the warehouse are kind of surrounded by nature and nothing else. So in the, in the summer, you got the expansion of the woods, obviously the angel share. But then in the winter, when you have this contraction, and obviously, you know, the, bra the, the barrel is kind of breathing with the whiskey inside. It releases so much flavor, which obviously you, you kind of don't have, you know, in, in, in place else. So if we're considering the angel share, for instance, is uh, in Scotland, I believe, is between 2 to 4% to the first year uh, of the total volume that is evaporated just during the, yeah, the, the you know, the, the climate, the, 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 the angel shell itself. Uh, but in uh, Kentucky, we're talking about 12 to 15% just the first two years. So definitely there is an impact on the production, but definitely, you know, you can smell that and you can feel it on the flavor as well. Um, now, when we taste bourbon, um, just, you know, to, to start with the first, for me, it's important to understand, first of all, what we, you know, what, what I have in front of me. So, you know, the fact that we read the label, we have already an idea. The mash bill helped a lot as well. Uh, not everyone released the mash bill. I'm lucky to work in a company that doesn't have any secret. Um, but when we actually smell it, we feel that the corn is, you know, it's kind of coming for, forward. With, we kind of have always that vanilla, vanilla flavor from a bourbon is always there for a reason because the barrel is brand new and you know american oak which is the most used uh you kind of don't have to go for american oak but uh, it's there and you know it's it's rich on lignin and uh, uh you know and what is actually give the the flavor that you want to your bourbon so michael michael what is um there's it says on the bottle sour mash which is so, often yeah, so sour mash, and to, to be fair with you, we kind of, you know, kept the bottle and the label as traditional as possible, even because it's kind of historical. But sour mash nowadays is uh, it's more like a, it's kind of an obvious process than everyone used, but it's really traditional. That's why it's in the label. Uh, sour mash is nothing else to take whatever is left over from the first distillation 
um, which obviously you know contain the yeast and the the you know the, the same mash that you use, and you put it on the nest um, fermentation tank. Uh, some people put it directly in the wash, so you know on the first distillation, so directly in the postio. But what you want to do is like you keep the consistency over the beer because of course you know the the consistency of the beer is the is the key you know the, the beer then you firm, the, the the you distill then just your whiskey and there is a lot of factor that might influence the the yeast and the fermentation uh, one of that can be uh, you know wild yeast and bacteria in the air so when you actually put the the back set then is the key of the sour mash the back set is the uh, previous fermentation the previous distillation when you put that in you you have such a such a, an acidic environment that you create then uh, uh bacteria cannot actually attack the yeast and change the mash right. um so it's a kind of precaution against uh lacto acid acetic acid and a lot of different uh factors that can influence the consistency over the, the mash so it maintains some of that sweetness as well perhaps <clears throat> yes yes um and also you know the sweetness in relation of a mesh, um, we kind of, you know, have the pH that we control constantly, and it's uh, it's the key really. Because if you see that your pH just drop down uh, really quickly uh, on the first, second, or third day of this uh, fermentation, you know, then the the mesh is becoming too sour, and there is something's going on. Mm. So if uh, sometimes it's become too sour because there are some acid that are being created by the environment you don't want that so sour mesh kind of prevent that in a way okay so we should we should move on to the first one let people try this uh the classic ezra brooks bourbon so as a brooks yeah the the classic bourbon 40 percent is definitely a whiskey that is being created for you know I wouldn't say uh, a whiskey that you wanted to open and put on the side. You want to you want to play with it. You want to you know enjoy, like you know, an everyday whiskey. Maybe mix mix it if you like. Uh, personally, I am not that guy that tell you how you, you drink your whiskey. I show you what I have. I always have a, a glass of water to refresh my palate and a straw just to put a few drop to my whiskey. And you know, obviously, the water is open up the flavor of the spirit. That's not just in whiskey, in every spirit, really. Um, and what, what you do, you you can kind of smell and taste something then it was there, it just then uh, um, alcohol is, uh, is such a heavy oil, you know, and uh, and water is a natural solvent, so it's kind of open it up. Yeah. Uh, now, once I personally smell the whiskey, what I try to do is don't smell it just with my nose, uh, simply because, well, I have a, Quite an important nose, as you can see. But you know, <laughs> if I if I smell only with my nose, it's actually kind of go directly to my eyes. Right. It's kind of a, a really strong impact, even though it's only for uh, forty percent. I have some water as well, so it's actually evaporating even quickly. But um, it doesn't have any space to aerate the whiskey in a way. So it's going through my nose to my eyes, and then go back on the same part, and it just burns. So what I try to do all the time is just to keep my mouth a bit open. Smell with my nose and keep a tiny bit of hair going inside my mouth. And doing that is almost like the the vapor escape through your mouth, leaving all the pleasure, you know, the the, the nice flavor behind without the the heat of the alcohol. So you yeah. kind of avoid all this, uh, you know, acetone, you know, and solvent. And then, then yeah, you know, sometimes it's not it's not nice uh, approach on whiskey straight away. So some people, you know, just slowly bring it up. I go directly with my nose, I keep my mouth open, and then I try to move one side and the other, and I kind of, you know, have a different pers uh, perspective of that. Sometimes I almost feel like a bit of peppery note from the rye on one side, and then more the caramel notes from the corn and the, uh, and the butter from the other. Definitely caramel. Definitely yeah. Kind of so, yeah, so the vanilla is, is definitely coming from, uh, uh, you know, the barrel. Uh, itself, corn is not as sweet as malted barley, for instance, uh, but the, it kind of leaves more space to the expression of the woods. And the fact that we need to burn the, uh, the barrel inside, we actually need to charge it. Uh, yeah. So once you actually burn, you caramelize the vanillin, and you create what, uh, you know, what we call the red line. So it's literally a red line between the stave of the woods 
Um, and once the whiskey get in, you know, and you have this absorption of the whiskey and the evaporation through the angiosphere, it's dissolved that red line of, of caramelized vanillin. And that's yeah. why you get all that kind of sweetness. Yeah. Should you guys a little bit of taste? Yeah. Let's have a little try. I'm a bit ahead of you, actually. I've been, I've been sipping it for a while. Oh, so, <laughs> Yeah. Well, trying to try to be good. At least I I change the whiskey every now and then. There's a little bit of um, there's a little bit of uh, smokiness in the back. Yeah. Yeah. Not yeah. Like smoke, but it's like that that ashy, just a little little hint of smoke there. Yeah, and that's you know all totally from the from the char. So when you charge the barrel, you, you create that layer of charcoal, which is in a way our filtration system in a way. Uh, but if there is any association with smoke, uh, we, we don't use any peat. There are some bourbon up there, then uh, you know they've been peating their, uh, their corn, I believe, but it's really a experimental small batch. And uh, you know, it's not really something that we're famous for. Um, I don't think it's uh, you know, something that we should be associated with. Uh, you know, we don't actually have peat and stuff, but uh, you know, the charging of the barrel definitely contributes to smoky flavor as well. Yeah, it's not it's not a PTI this smoke. No, this is this is a very yeah. subtle, just like that first char, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. But it's very, 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 you know, it's a lot of people aren't even going to get it. It's, it's not it's not like it's a big thing. Um, but really good flavor, and it, and I love that uh, a little bit of cherry maybe as well. Yeah, if you want, yes. And uh, there's someone that commented the peppery flavor. I I, I agree. Um, I think you know, at the Brooks, they have that. You know that it's easy, it's smooth, but then you got that peppery coming through on the back of your palate. You know, they're almost like they're growing in you. Um, and uh, yeah, that's kind of you know, in a way, even a signature of the brand, if you want. Yeah. So, so guys, if you want to add some ginger ale to this, are we gonna? So this one, or should we do it with the the rye? Uh, so I think we should uh, maybe go for the rye in the meantime. Now the rye that we have here is uh, is one of the smoothest, really, uh, of the rye that you can find, simply because it's quite low in uh, in in rye in the mash bill. So consider then uh, um, our our mash bill is fifty one percent rye. So it's actually just what you need by law to be a rye whiskey. Also, what we do, we use carbon filter. So we charcoal filter the whiskey before we bottle it. And so, you know, if we consider then, uh, yeah, 41, uh, sorry, 51% uh, is rye. We got four percent to malted barley, so just what you need, just enough maltos to start the fermentation, yeah. um, and the rest is corn. You actually, on the smell already, rye is never as pronounced as a bourbon, simply because the rye itself, as a um, as a whiskey, most of the time is associated with uh, grassy and uh, floral notes. Uh, yeah. It's quite more delicate on the on the smell, and especially. As a bartender, I love that because when I do a Manhattan, the rice gives so much space for all the rest of the ingredients that you drink. So yeah. you can actually smell the vermouth. Uh, but then when you drink it, the rice is supposed to give you that kick. You know, it's give you that. Yes. Yeah. So, so to be rye, it has to be just 51% rye. That, that's correct. So yeah. it's kind of following the same rule of a bourbon, but you know, you, you need to have 51% at least of rye. Uh, yeah. It's the same with wheat, bourbon, uh, wheat whiskey, for instance, 51% wheat will do, do wheat whiskey. The only exception really is bourbon because bourbon have actually two limits. So the first one is 51% corn to be a bourbon. But then if you actually reach 80%, 80% uh, corn in, uh, in a bourbon is still a bourbon, but it's really a corn whiskey, which is an, another category. And corn whiskey doesn't actually need to be aged. So it's the only whiskey in the world, and it doesn't need to touch the barrel at all. You can yeah. still call it whiskey. You don't call it moonshine or new make or white dog or anything else. Mm. Okay. Answer me the question: um, Why do you charcoal filter before bottling? So when we try, we kind of see then uh, you got the spicy peppery note, 
by Silky. It's smooth. And uh, it's kind of, you know, it's do, do that smooth sensation you created through, you know, the charcoal filter. And uh, in a way, you know, it's the only thing you can do to a bourbon uh, before bottling then uh, it's allowed because you, you can't add any flavor. If you use any other filtration, so for instance, if you're using the um, Lincoln County filtration uh, of, you know, for uh, Tennessee whiskey, you will actually have the distinctive notes coming from the maple charcoal. Uh, we could not because otherwise we couldn't call ourselves bourbon. Uh, so it's the only filtration allowed. It smooths be around the edge, but it actually doesn't change as much, you know, the main spirit. So Matthew, love this 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 guy. I think he's on the right. I'm sure he's on the right. So the rye is never um, it's never been as popular as you know bourbon or as you know uh, other category of whiskey simply because that kick that you have. But you know, I have people then don't like bourbon because they you know they just knock in on that uh, sweet notes, you know, the right. vanilla, the caramel. That you know, silkiness is smooth to it, and they absolutely love the rye because it gives you that you know, grassy, spicy sensation to it. So, I haven't tasted this particular rye from Ezra Brooks. The first thing I noticed is obviously the strength is 45, whereas the bourbon was at 40. Yeah, um, and and also, I think just from the nose, it's probably going to be a bit more approachable than other rye, you know. that a little bit just too spicy, a little bit too dry. Yeah. I think one feels just on the nose, it's going to have a little bit more e easiness to it, a bit more approachable. Well, this one as a rye is, uh, you know, it's kind of a bartender rye for the reason then, uh, well, 45% already uh, kind of help us out and I put myself in the group uh, because, you know, you control better the dilution. So... That five percent more in ABV is perfect when you want to mix it, you know, with a vermouth, with you know, we we whatever really. I always have, you know, a vermouth with me. Uh, you know, you do a, an old fashioned. You can actually do an old fashioned with a rye that is not as high in rye. Uh, respect what is up there. Um, you know, there are some rye that are just a lot, a lot of spiciness, and uh, you know, they're not as smooth and as easy to sip. As you know, yeah. some rye that might be, you know, 51%, for instance, uh, or, you know, a charcoal filter. Uh, so I believe, you know, personally, I enjoy even in an old fashion. Not yeah. then, uh, yeah, classically, it's bourbon, but if you have a rye that is smooth and it got that spiciness, it's almost like an old fashion with a kick. Yeah, yeah. So it's a classic thing uh, for the guys listening. The, the rye, the quality of a rye spirit is that that dry spiciness compared to a, a bourbon, which has that obvious vanilla kind of sweetness, but you're still getting with this, that lovely chocolatey note. Yeah, yeah, um, correct. I actually feel a bit of cocoa as well. Um, yeah, uh, I believe, you know, rye itself is, uh, uh, is a whiskey that is slowly coming back um, because, you know, people are more open-minded, I believe. You know, now they, you know, we are more keen to explore different profile and such. Uh, but it's so much uh, on the, you know, on the spicy, on the, uh, sometimes on the bitter notes. So, you know, bitter yeah. coffee or bitter co dark cocoa um, mm. or, you know, beer ginger right there. Yeah, yeah. But, so, but I, think, I think someone said that they're getting a bit, a bit of pear drops, you know. So I think there's a nice balance of this sort of white fruit, not, not as rich kind of plummy fruit as with a bourbon, but yeah. just that white fruit. I think it's a good balance. You've got a new fan as well. Anthony says that he doesn't normally like rye, but he, he, he thinks this is delicious. Cool. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad. Thank you. So um, this one here, is, uh, we actually start with Edza Brooks because in a way it's the easier one. So uh, I, you know, I will suggest to go crazy to, uh, to mix it, to try and cocktail, you know, and uh, uh, with your favorite uh, spirits, if you, with your favorite mix, uh, in the end of the day, is there to you know to to kind of you know uh, change shape and form? Um, it's not as you know one brand that we particularly said. Okay, maybe you should buy that keeper on the side. You know, we we have some limited edition that are quite quite unique, quite you know noisy to find. Um, yeah. But you know, in this case, those two are you know the the go to whiskey 
uh, every day, you know, play around with it. Yeah. Shall we add some ginger ale to this one and see, see if that changes it in any way? Yeah. Yeah, guys, if you want to add your ginger ale that we've, uh, that we've added in your pack um, and just see, see what happens. Normally, I advise two parts to one, but um, Michaela, if you have a, an alternative, then... So well, I I don't have actually any ginger ale with me, unfortunately, um, because I, I actually believe it would be great because you know the spiciness of the rye will just match perfectly. Um, personally, I you know I use the same formula for, for a gin and tonic, so you know one part and uh, and two of the uh, one part of the whiskey and two of the ginger beer, uh, but only we whiskey then the survey. Um, you know, in a way, you want to match the profile. Sometimes, you know, even require less ginger beer. I'm not even sure what type of ginger beer you guys have there. I've just given the fever tree ginger ale. Fever tree, yeah, cool. So, well, yeah, in, term, yeah. in terms of, you know, fever tree, I believe it's kind of, you know, mild. It's not as fiery as, you know, mm -hmm. uh, some ginger beer up there. So you can, you know, you can just go as crazy as you like. I'd suggest, you know, it depends as much uh, of the whiskey and as much of the, the, the mixer as well. Yeah. I, th I think this drink now is great as a rye uh, on its own and, and probably best just sipped or made as an old-fashioned. But if you serve it long with ginger ale like we've done today and you chuck in a load of ice, maybe just a little orange peel or cherry. Yeah. As a garnish, I, think, I think it makes a really good kind of nice, easy sort of summer, summery type of drink still. Yeah, it does. Uh, personally, you know, I like to always add something as well. So consider that, you know, it's, uh, it's dry and spicy. You got the spice in it from the ginger beer. Uh, I personally, I'm, I'm, I'm Italian. I can't help it. I would put even a bit of dry vermouth if you go up there. Yeah. Uh, you know, but, you know, in, by, by all means, uh, you know, you can, you can go crazy. If you, uh, if you like bitter uh personally i believe you know i i love to add the bit of chocolate bitter on my ginger ale and, and yeah. whiskey uh it's depend yeah. on the whiskey again but you know you you mentioned there's cocoa uh you know notes on the you know adds, adds of dry uh, rice so that, that could be a good idea as well yeah yeah i think a lot of people prefer it neat um so which is testament probably to to the right and and the spirit it, it, that ezra brooks have made that's great, yeah, absolutely. He loves the Ever Brooks. They're from phenomenal. Uh, thanks for introducing us to them. Uh, so yeah, so people people are loving the Ezra Brooks range. It's really good. Well, we we are extremely glad, even because um, I believe Ezra Brooks is, uh, is you know is as, as I said, is such a historical name, and we want to make sure that you know is uh, we we get the right. The right weight to the name as well so uh obviously the brands it go a long way uh the company then uh, you know they are represent Loxco hereditate the brands we actually now do it in our brand new distillery uh and you know it's important the consistency over uh something then uh, we we are doing um is always try to evolve the brand keep it as traditional as possible so we might you might see some edition special edition up there uh, the Ezra 7, for instance, won several awards this year. Uh, but, you know, in terms of those two, those two are, you know, our signature in a way. Uh, and, you know, it's, a, it's an identity that we have and we want to make sure, especially uh, bartenders, you know, or whoever is, uh, is a fan of it, you know, have every day the same, you know, and recognize them in this. Yeah. Can you, can you just give us a... So this is something that we, we had a lot of when we opened the shop. And we were stocking bourbons, obviously, that weren't Jack Daniels, right? Yeah. Can you give us a little bit of history of the labelling and the bottle shape? Because this oh, is something that we come across quite a lot, which we had to obviously learn about. Fair so, enough. Okay, yeah. so let's, uh, you know, I will just get straight to the point. Uh, we had a case, a legal case with, uh, yeah, with, with Jack Daniels. Um, you know, there was a legal case over the label and they, you know, they've been uh, saying that uh, this label was looking too much as uh, Jack Daniel. Now, first of all, the square bottle is extremely traditional in Kentucky. We're talking about, you know, uh, it was just easy to transport, you know, easy to bring it around and so on. 
uh, as modern style of bottle, of course. But uh, the label, which is what the you Noiza know, Brooks is being sued on, it says explicitly many different things that you know bring us way far from the Kentucky, uh, from from the Tennessee category. So we won over the fact that it's a, a Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey. And because it's a Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey, we need to respect so many laws to get in those four letters and those four words and add this label how it is, then uh, it's actually of, it would it be easier for us to just to go for an imitation label, but no, this is, you know, actually it's a, a, it's a historical brand. It's been around for, you know, ages. The, the guy is the guy then pretty much, you know, the pioneer of, uh, of bourbon. And uh, what it represents is, you know, the process behind the bourbon whiskey, which, as we mentioned already, you know, is quite long and it's quite, you know, uh, deep into detail. So in, in the end, of course, yeah, we, we won. Um, not then, you know, we are uh, bringing that, that up on, uh, you know, on marketing or stuff. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's a story. It's a story to tell. It's full of story about, you know, people suing people in the uh, whiskey category, especially in America. Yeah, yeah. There are people, you know, fighting over who's the bird of Kentucky, or you know, who's uh, been following the buffalo before and whatever. Uh, yeah. And of course, we have our bit of uh, story on. Uh, but the yeah. thing is, this bottle is actually it's, it's it's a generic kind of bottle that was, you know, it, it wasn't like you had a choice back then to just go yeah. and shop for any bottle you wanted, right? You had two shapes of yeah. kind of bottle. This was one, and and so right. that. That's what it is, right? It's not like Jack Daniels have trademarked anything. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, you, you're exactly right. Even because you know Jim Bean have a similar shape, and you know there are yeah. many other that can you know that I can uh, that I can bring up. Uh, but yeah, this is absolutely a traditional shape. There were, I believe, four different traditional shape. Uh, there was the the shortened with the big shoulder and the long neck. Yeah. Uh, which is not much around anymore. Um, David Nicholson used to have that shape. Uh, Old Fitzgerald used to have that shape, and it was simply because you can actually latch the neck of your bourbon to the, you know, to to your horse. Um, and then, uh, and then there was, uh, you know, the medicinal bottle shape. Yeah. And then people used to say then it was because uh, back in the day with the bootlegger, you can actually hide this, you know, just slip in tr inside your boot. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, and that's one one legend behind. The other one is uh, uh, then whiskey was served from the barrel in the bar, and this is the bottle. Then you know the uh, yeah the, the the guy will actually bring on your table, and you were allowed to refill from the cask and pay by you know refill. Uh, yeah. The other traditional <laughs> one is this one, of course, and yeah. then you still have you know this uh, kind of wine bottle shape, especially uh, coming from Kentucky, and that's you know was when everyone start to open a small distillery and use any type of shape available. And there was a lot of wine bottle back there. Yeah. Okay, but, yeah. guys, that is our introduction. You can't see me very well, but that may, may McKenna, can you hold your bottles up? <laughs> These are, that's an introduction to the Ezra Brooks, uh, the straight bourbon and the uh, rye, which I think are absolutely phenomenal. And a lot of people are also commenting, saying the same thing. Um, they are available um, as, as of the next few days in our shop. Um, and obviously, everyone for being in our tasting gets 10% off the bottle price. So come and see us. Um, but we should move on to our Yellowstone. So we're stepping up a level. Yeah. So uh, Yellowstone is uh, it's quite a particular brand. I believe that it's, uh, it's, it's magical, the story, the people behind. Uh, the liquid, of course, uh, but you know when we're talking about Yellowstone, we're talking about one of the most traditional and old brands, you know, up there of bourbon. So first of all, uh, so Yellowstone is the name of a national park, but it's uh, it's not made, of course, in the national park. Uh, if you see, there is, uh, you know, it's, it says since 1872. Uh, this one was was when this bourbon was actually sold. And it didn't have actually a name, so it was sold by the barrel to uh, you know like source whiskey. So people that actually were bottling their whiskey, maybe you know bottling a different strength and put their name on it and so on. And there was this uh, uh, sell person, you know, or ambassador, then uh, came back from one of his uh, 
you know, travel with uh, with this bourbon and came back to what it was back then, the uh, Cold Spring Distillery. And uh, and he said to uh, back in the day, minor case being, uh, we we need to create a name after this park that everyone talking about, which is you know national park. It's a new opening, and uh, you know your whiskey is already you know well well received. I think we should bottle it. We should give it an identity, and we should you know just make it how it is, call it Yellowstone, and that's why the name. Uh, now to bring honor to that you know we obviously irritate the brands you know and it's the same liquid as it was the the same label is slightly changing color but you know we try to keep it as traditional as possible it's not a sense color anymore I, like you see it now uh, i think there we go uh yeah. it's actually a bit white uh we actually put a white background uh but to actually bring our contribution to the national park as today part of each bottle that is being sold going to say the national park so part of the profit go to the park uh it's something then uh, we don't really say as much as we should i believe because you know today then everyone is more aware of the green planet we've been doing that from the beginning and we never stopped uh also this brand here is uh from the 1872 survived the prohibitionism and it was still produced even during prohibitionism so as we know, uh, it was one of the dark time in uh, in America. Um, well, not as dark as uh, it could be, yeah. Uh, now, but uh, you know, prohibitionism was a bad thing from one side because the quality of the bourbon kind of dropped down. There was a lot of uh, bootlegger and people that was doing uh, illegal stuff and make people sick. Uh, but on one side, there was for me what it created bartending because everyone was. Uh, uh, forced to go in the in the bar uh, really discreetly to make sure that no one will say a word about what we were doing, which it was enjoy alcohol together. And it was a time when back in the day, uh, women were allowed in the bar. Uh, you know, uh, people from other ethnicity than were you know white American weren't allowed in the bar. So with the prohibition and the speakeasy bar, it didn't matter anymore. So you had for the first time the society then goes together for the same goal, which is drinking alcohol and doesn't look at your color, your skin, your ethnicity, your you know, uh, you know, wh whoever. It doesn't matter. We're there for the same reason. Uh, so that's for me, you know, it's uh, it's important one side. It's important as well to know. Then uh, uh, prohibitionism was uh, the the highest period when people was getting sick. Because there was a uh, uh, six distillery that actually uh, managed to have the medicinal license, and uh, uh, we were in one of these, uh, which it was back then. Yeah, back then it was Brown Former doing it, um, and uh, along with the and Weller Distillery and, and few many, uh, you could potentially go in the uh, in your pharmacy and get some whiskey for your medical condition. Now we had so many different medical conditions back then. People go uh, and, you know, ask for some whiskey if you are uh, pregnant or if you're blind or if you lost a leg. It didn't really matter. Uh, but Yellowstone was one of the medicine that you could actually get. Um, now, talking about who's the guy behind, in the meantime, and we talk about, I will put a bit of it. Now, the guy behind, you can see it, well, uh, not in your case, but in the back on the label, it says Stephen Beam. So Stephen yeah. Beam uh, is kind of resembled the name of uh, Beam as Jim Beam the brand. Now Jim Beam nowadays is uh, uh, is, is belong to the uh, Abraham Santori, so it's not really belong to the family Beam anymore. Uh, there is uh, the uh, Frederick No uh, which is the global brand ambassador, and uh, he have a Beam on his mother's side, if I'm not wrong. Uh, now, Stephen Beam is actually the last Beam alive <clears throat> owning a distillery in Kentucky, uh, which is, you know, it's not a small deal. Now, consider then uh, uh, Yellowstone. It used to be made back in the day from the Beam, and especially from the last Beam uh, distilling, you know, right before Prohibition, in which it was Minor Case Beam, uh, and that's why the name of the rye whiskey. So Minor Case was a name. I know it sounds weird, uh, you know, is <laughs> there is people in the family of Beam that have uh, uh, weird names, such small words, for instance. Uh, but uh, minor case Beam was distilling this, 
And then uh, during prohibition, is, he, uh, he died about 150 days after prohibition is ended. So what he wanted to do it was to uh, Steam Beam and his brother, Paul Beam, they, they uh, kind of wanted to recreate the brand, open the distillery for you know, exactly what it used to be. And uh, it's quite magical because if you, if you go on the website, for instance, you can see the distillery is one of the smallest distillery you can find in Kentucky. And this year, we actually even won Distillery of the Year because it's what is supposed to be a craft whiskey, a craft, you know, a bourbon. Now, the word craft, it doesn't really mean much because as long as you do less than 52,000 bottles a year, which is the not many, you are a craft. But in this particular case, we're talking about one barrel a day only. So it's only, you know, if we run, it's only about 400 barrel in one year, which is right. nothing really. Uh, it's, you know, we're talking about one man operation distillery. And the reason why, you know, it's only one barrel a day is because the steam bean didn't want to go for any compromise. He didn't want to go for a column steel. Uh, you know, he had this 600 liter um, osteo, which, you know, once you actually distill the wash and then, you, you know, you need to distill it once more, you got the head detail, you cut it and you have about, you know, one barrel. Uh, that's all. Uh, but if we're talking about the how traditional it can be, so first of all, the uh, steam beam had a recipe book that uh, used to belong to his father, and uh, you know, and generation by generation, and you got some recipe there from uh, minor case beam and from Jacob beam, <coughs> and he find that you know the recipe of minor case, which this gra grandfather could never finish because you know he died. 150 uh, day after the prohibition is finished. So what he started to do, it was actually the first whiskey he started to do in his distillery was a minor case, but not as we know it today. It was only 151 days old and was called Revenge. It was a moonshine uh, barrel age. And uh, it was just called Revenge because, you know, it was in a way the Revenge of minor case, and then he didn't make it to call it a straight uh, dry because he wasn't, you know, two years old. Um, in the meantime, he was working on something quite serious, which he was uh, recreate the recipe of Yellowstone. So through the recipe book, he find the same grain, the same origin. You know, uh, we're talking about those three. So heirloom white corn, the rye, which is about 15%, and then 13% of malted barley. There we go. Um, but this one wasn't enough. Uh, you go, you know, you got the same hostile, which is great, but still not enough. The same water, which is the limestone branch, but still it's not enough. What is actually uh, will be the closest thing as possible to keep the consistency of a whiskey would be to have the yeast strain. But the yeast strain from a bean, which is you know from a, you know in, a, in 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 such a brand that is from the 1872. Back in the day, people used to not have a refrigerator. And being uh, the, the yeast, it wasn't dry yeast. It was most of the time liquid form. So they used to put the yeast in a, in a yeast jug, um, bring it back home and put inside the, you know, the bell, uh, you know, underwater, try to keep it as cold as possible and bring it back, you know, to work the day after, uh, you know, just in case a disaster will happen and uh, you will need to start from zero. At least you will have your, the, you know, your yeast. And that's kind of you know what was the signature of uh, big distillers such as the Dant of the of, of the Bean. Uh, Jacob Bean, for instance, was famous to uh, sleep with his yeast jug and not with his wife uh, because you know he was carrying more from you know this DNA of the mash than than anything else. So yeah. Steam Bean didn't have that. But what actually happened then uh, in the Kentucky Bourbon Museum, he, he spot a yeast jug back from the 1851 say minor case beam. So he claimed to be the last beam, you know, and the direct, you know, uh, family line from minor case. And he said pretty much to the museum, I, I need that container. Um, I need that jug because I need to. Oh no, it's gone. Okay guys, so uh, while we're trying to bring him back, we're on perhaps number three, the Yellowstone select um so why don't we go for a little i know some of you have already gone in for a little sample um on the nose there's lovely sort of cherries and a, and a kind of leathery richness
Hello. Hey, you're back. Yeah, sorry. I don't know what happened there. That's all right. I was just taking them through the flavor profile a little oh. bit and a little sample, but yeah. So, uh, so what I was saying is, uh, he actually, what he managed, he managed to do is to get this uh, yeast jug from the museum, uh, which at one point we even have it in the distillery. It's kind of, you know, in and out because it needs to go back in the museum every now and then. Uh, but he brought it to those, uh, those experts of uh, yeast. So there is this place called um, Yeast Farm. Uh, and uh, it's kind of, you know, they keep all the DNA and the yeast strain for all the distillery in Kentucky. So he went to them and say, listen, we, you need to help me out because uh, you, you need to scratch the inside of this container, get the yeast and reactivate the yeast for me because I need to do, you know, Yellowstone as you used to. Uh, and they said then that was pretty much impossible. Uh, so what they did was the second best thing, which was extract from the yeast container the DNA and match through the DNA uh, to a yeast existing nowadays in the atmosphere and bring those two together. So it's actually, they find the perfect match through the DNA of that yeast. Yeah. And that's how they managed to make Yellowstone today. Mm. So it's a kind of, you know, in a way, um, a bit of a prehistoric yeast, you know, uh, it's a bit of a Jurassic Park or bourbon in a way, uh, in terms of, you know, how they recreate that flavor profile and such. Uh, but I find it quite fascinating that we could do that today with the new technology um, and, you know, recreate exactly the same flavor of what it was, the original mesh of uh, yeah. the bean family. Yeah. I'm just looking at some of the comments. People, are, A lot of people are getting banana. Mm. Obviously, it's a peppery finish, which, which is obvious. Um, but banana so, seems to be a big thing. Yeah. So, I agree. Uh, I agree on banana. I agree on uh, that kind of uh, sweet and uh, milky, silky flavor. Mm. So if I only smell it without tasting it, I always get that kind of, uh, I don't know, I'm almost uh, going for a, a milkshake. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, you got some fruitiness coming through. Uh, yeah. But then I believe that banana is especially coming from the mesh. So when we distill it with a posture, Already you distill in low temperature. Uh, the fact that it's a posteo is, is such a small batch that you kind of keep concentrated all the flavor of that distilled beer. So the beer is so important that the yeast and the mash bill have massive impact on the final product. Mm. There are some distillery up there, like uh, for Roses, they use five different uh, yeast mm. to do you know, one product. So the yeast, uh, for me, it, it, it does make you know the the you know the different um people are not talking so much about the yeast as they should and if we're talking about yeast from the 8052 that's probably the flavor than uh, you know kentucky bourbon used to have and uh, what we try to reach as well today um mm. sometime um guys we're gonna add some chocolate to this one sorry break out your chocolate and um my son's need my bit of chocolate little bugger <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, get your chocolate. It's got a little bit of nuttiness in there, a little bit of orange. That should pair nicely with this particular particular um, whiskey, bourbon. Um, I personally find a hint of smokiness on this one as well. Yeah. Um, I believe, you know, it's kind of coming back on your palate. Yeah. Uh, in terms of, you know, the mash bill, even though it have a bit more ride than Edza Brooks, uh, it's a bit more smooth a bit more silky mm. um we talking yeah we're talking about a slightly uh older whiskey respects as a brooks so i as a brooks so we will have you know about four years um four to six year uh but you know the, the the minimum needs to be four this one here you know you got a big body of a six and a seven you can kind of feel that you know coming through yeah you definitely got more, you know, flavor from the from the barrel, a bit more, you know, chocolate, caramel, vanilla, uh, yeah. but then a bit of spicy nose as well. I yeah. got that citrus, uh, ginger, mix it with, you know, a bit of, uh, uh, yeah, banana as well. Um, mm. But yeah, it's a, quite more complex, I believe. I'm definitely getting more cherry than banana myself. That's just the way my palate works. Yeah, no, no, there is, you know, it's again, you know, cherry is one of the notes, and then they. Uh, you know, they, they bring it up with Yellowstone. I personally think it's, uh, it's completely personal. Um, I once want to uh, 
a guy and say the Yellowstone, Yellowstone it tastes like uh, Oreo milkshake. And uh, honestly, well, you know, it smells like Oreo milkshake. I was like, honestly, dude, you know, if uh, I believe the more you say it, the more I feel it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. it's, it's a lot of mental su suggestion, isn't it? And, uh, you know, in the end, every flavor can be there. But definitely you have a bit more fruity notes. Yeah. Respect. Yeah. Respect at the Brooks. And uh, we're talking about different type of distillation as well, because a uh, column steel as at the Brooks, it tend to, you know, release less from the mesh and more from the barrel. That's mm. what I believe. Yeah. Um, a post steel, the mesh have definitely a bigger impact on, you know, on the final product. And, you know, Yellowstone is a small post steel yeah. uh, as a Brooks, you know, uh, column. You can totally tell. That, I mean, as a Brooks is great. You know, everyone loved it. But Yellowstone has a lot more weight to it. You know, it's a lot more rich, a lot more thicker, oily. You know, if you look at the glass, it's just, it's, it's literally just, you know, big, big legs rolling down the glass. Yeah. Um, but we're talking as well about 46.5. Exactly, yeah. Oh, that that helped a lot. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so I think people really like it and people really like it with the chocolate. It's, it's a really good, it's an obvious pairing, which is why we, we went for it. But it's something that people don't really think about too much. It, it's just, it's just a very good pairing. Yeah. And, you know, and I suggest as well to put some water in there. Mm -hmm. uh, don't be afraid to do so. Um, you know, personally, I I go with quite a bit of water and I try my whiskey. It might seem weird, but I try my whiskey until I reach half and half water and whiskey. And oh, see really? If I, yeah, and see if I lose completely when it's equal part or yeah. all the whiskey, all the flavor. And if I don't, then I tend to like that whiskey a bit more. Um, and, you know, and this is the case. I didn't try it with water, but I should do. And I personally believe there is a, a lot of different like layer of flavor that you mm. explore only when you have enough dilution. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or you know, you can always do what they what they do in America. They call it the Kentucky chew. You know, they kind of say the water is your mouth. You got the amylase in your saliva. So just move it around as much as you can, and you know, get that that dilution through your body and that's the most natural flavor water you can have because that is that is that is my that's what i tend to do more of i, yeah. I, just, think, I just think the flavor develops in your palate and you can really feel it developing yeah that's you know i always say that. surely it's one way i personally try some whiskey that are 63.4 yeah. uh or you know even close to 70 percent so on that sense my salivation is not enough really to break it down as you know as much as i wish even because but it's depend on the palate and it's depend on you know everyone got different salivation and such but um i believe my palate tend to appreciate a bit more the layer that i hide through this you know complex oil or the alcohol when i add a bit of water to it yeah um, and you know and then i can i can drink heavy i just you know um, I like to explore a bit all that. Yeah, really. Yeah, you want to, you know, the dilution just adds, like you say, it just brings out all these extra flavors. Yeah. Very important. And especially um, on the nose. Yeah. Yeah. So that's Yellowstone. Yeah. Very, very nice. Strongest one we've tasted at 46.5. Um, and really, really good. I, th I think we'll have a lot of fans for that. Yeah. Well, I, I, I am a big fan as well um we we won several medal um i won't bring too much of that but you know one things that i'm quite particularly proud of we we won distillery of the year um and you know the reason why is the the history behind it just get you know crazy you know if i go through the family history of you know the the beam and the seventh generation and now we got there uh and you know and and how we actually keep the brand what it is. We're talking about a brand as well that was the most sold brand in America. And one out of three bottles of uh, American whiskey was Yellowstone. If we're talking about the 60, the 80, uh, it was crazy. And uh, and this one here as well, we have some, uh, uh, some, some tale talking about the official bourbon from the Kentucky Mint Julep. So I do suggest to try in a Mint Julep. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but I never run out of mint. Okay. Uh, 
for that sex because it's just doing a bang game in julep. And especially what I love about the julep is then, uh, in a way, it is the dilution of water bring up so much of the flavor of the bourbon. So if you do it with a crappy bourbon, it's undrinkable. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But you know, if you do it properly, you know, with uh, with something that the server is definitely have a, a, a lot, quite a lot of flavor. So this was the original bourbon from Mint Julep. That's correct. Amazing. Yeah. There you go. So guys, uh, we should move on to our rye, our minor case, which is part of the same family, right? Correct. So minor case is coming from the same distillery at Yellowstone. So we had two distillery here. We got the, the first one that we tried, the Lux Row. Uh, Lux Row is from the family Lux, which is co-owner of the Limestone Branch Distillery, which uh, is the distillery of Stephen Beam. Now, on the minor case Beam, we have something quite particular because now I, I invite everyone to um, correct me in this. And please do, because it's three years that I'm really, really looking for something that is similar to it. But this one is the only rye whiskey in the world, which is finishing uh, American cream sherry. Yeah. Um, and it's, uh, it's really different from any other sherry finish, because I love sherry. I'm a big fan of sherry. But you can have so many profiles of sherry, and especially if sherry comes from Jerez. Um, you know, and the fact that it's come from Jerez, you know, is... Uh, it's kind of talked by itself. This one here is an American sherry to start with. Uh, when we're talking about sherry in uh, in whiskey, most of the time we're talking about either the Oloroso sherry, which adding a lot of leather notes, a bit of spiciness to it, or Pedro Ximene, which mm. everyone love and adore because it's the sweetest profile. You got that kind of molasses, you know, and dry fruits, dry raisin and such. But a cream sherry allows you to mix together different profiles of sherry. So from a really dry and spicy one and a sweet one, you know, and you create whatever you 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 please. And the fact then, you know, is allowed outside of RS. Um, you know, I'm we're doing that from London, you know, uh in, in uh, we had here a Bristol cream, which was famous around the world. Yeah. Um, you know, so cream sherry are allowed everywhere. Uh this one here, especially the Maya 44, then we use um as a cask. It was the sherry of the president. Uh, yeah, so that was the favorite um, uh, sherry of Kennedy, and um, the reason why we decide to, you know, uh, Steam Bean decide to finish it in the cream sherry is because, first of all, minor case, as we mentioned, it was the rye whiskey that his grandfather couldn't actually finish. So this one here is finally finished to call it, you know, a straight rye. We're talking about, you know, uh, not. Well, just enough again to call it, you know, rye whiskey, 51%. But he wanted to create something a bit different. So in terms of Yellowstone, he resurrected this, you know, this brand with the same mash bill, with the same, you know, recipe, the same yeast, the same distillation and everything. But he was like, okay, what about my expression? So he finished minor case on something that is quite linked to his family, which most of the people don't know, but the Bean family actually have some... Uh, um, some origin in uh, in England, and you know England is famous for, of course, gin, but even for the cream sherry. So he uh, finish it between six months to eight months in the cream sherry. When I smell minor case personally, and that might seem weird, I smell like condensed milk. It's almost really? like I'm drinking a, a glass of milk. I prepare myself to have that, you know, that cream silky sensation. That's amazing. And, you know, the more I smell it, the more it makes me salivate. It makes me go back when I was a child. But then when I when I drink it, and then again, it's completely personal mm. because there is not much sense in what I'm saying. But my grandfather used to have this uh, candy that uh, I think um, that's similar to the Warner's original. Uh, but you know, that kind of dulce de leche, you know, that kind yeah, of yeah. with caramel notes, uh, mix it with condensed milk, and it's uh, yeah, it's it, it, it's, it's kind of that butterscotch flavor, yeah, 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 yeah. exactly, yeah, yeah, That's amazing, uh, yeah, yeah. Or in Ireland, they have a yalaman uh, candy, which is you know, similar, okay. uh, but you know, it's something mixed between honeycomb, condensed milk, you know, yeah. and uh, um, yeah, I believe it's. There is nothing like that around, you know. Personally, the cream sherry, the American cream sherry, is 
it's it just unique. Yeah. Um, also, you know, just based on the taste and the smell, you know, and the color. Um, now, if I compare this, you know, those two together, uh, it's actually quite a similar color. Mm. But it's incredible to, to think um, about, you know, the age of minor case. You know, it's most of the people will actually guess that then it's, uh, you know, it's quite, it's quite a well-aged dry in terms of, you know, some, some, some people told me then, uh, you know, they, they think it's, it's 10, 12, you know, 15, because the smoothness, because the sweetness. Uh, it, it's shocking to know that it's just a two years old. How old? Only two years. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, it's you know, like, it's, uh, so hot that it just it gets so much extra aging, yeah. Yeah, you know, it just, uh, it's incredible what six months or, you know, or eight uh, can do in a cream sherry when you start with a banging rye whiskey. It yeah. just, it's just incredible the, the amount of sweetness that you get. Um, you know, obviously, the fact that, you know, it's, it's aging, uh, uh, you know, in a hot climate, it's, it, it helps. But, you know, it's definitely that, you know, that, to, uh, to, you know, to that second, the second barrel, which it just impacts so much flavor to it. Yeah. Now this yeah. one again is it is an everyday you know uh, rye. That's what they say in the limestone branch. Personally, I think you know this rye is exceptional. Uh, I believe you know it's a it's a premium rye in uh, you know in in an everyday bottle and price. Um, yeah. But is you know what they wanted to do is actually to make sure the bartender are not scared to use it yeah. uh, and I'm encouraging everyone to use it because you know they they put um a tag in the label say uh, it does the best manhattan um i agree of course you know the cream sherry obviously is gonna work so well you know with the uh, sweet vermouth yeah. uh, i believe by itself is uh, it's an amazing whiskey for every every cocktail, you know. I'm a, a big fan of old-fashioned, but I drink my old-fashioned with a good rye, if I have a good rye. Uh, this one here, if you know, if you can do a, a, a good old-fashioned with Edza Brooks rye, this one here is just a three-dimensional butterscotch old-fashioned, you know, by yeah, itself. Yeah, imagine that'd be phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I do have here, uh, this one is actually, I prepared this for minor case. Uh, so this one here is... Uh, it's a really rich syrup, as you can see, crystallized mm. inside. Uh, but I use the Merara syrup, and I put a bit of uh, salt and a tiny bit of black pepper. Okay. And it, yeah, and I literally just mix it with the Biongo Stura and Minor Case Rye, and mm. uh, it just it, it, it tastes like I, I, I don't want to get rude, but it, it tastes like heaven. Let's say. Amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. So actually, some people are getting. A couple of people get like apple flavors on the nose, maybe. Um, I don't know if that's something that is has been spoken about before. Yeah. Well, I personally, you know, think there is a fruity profile, and it's that kind of fruity profile that is not too predominant on the sweet fruit. So uh, people bring bring before green apple, pear drop, you know, uh, uh, green grapes. Um, I think it's there, definitely. Yeah. And that's from the rye by itself as a structure. Yeah. So those people then detect the, uh, the 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 apple. I believe they they went even through that smell of you know the cream sherry, uh, the even cream after cherry. the creaminess, the milky get into yeah. the you know the, the the bottom line, which is the the rye itself. They make it like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I believe it's there definitely. And uh, this part. Ter Terence wants the recipe for your um, your syrup. Oh yeah, it's uh, I, I personally put a lot of sugar cane, uh, you know, just brown uh, demerara sugar, um, and uh, usually I put about three parts demerara sugar, one part water, which okay. are a bit too much because it crystallizes. But the fact that it crystallizes means that it won't go off as right. you know as fast. Um, so I don't need to put that drop of water you know, or alcohol to you know to prevent spoiling. Uh, but then, yeah, two uh, generous teaspoon of uh, black pepper, a liver all, and just an inch of salt, and you know, and thus you reach the boiling point, filter it over, put it in a jar. Yeah, amazing. But, you know, it's it's, it's it's quite simple because in the end, I don't like to to add much when uh, you know you already have complexity on the whiskey. Yeah. Um, 
What is the main difference uh, between this Ezra Wright apart from the sherry finish? Well, this one here is not being filtered to start with. So they share the same mash bill, but uh, consider then uh, a lot of distilleries sharing the same mash bill. You'd be surprised. Uh, we are talking about probably 20 different mash bill over 4,000 bourbon up there. Um, so it's the fact that, first of all, it's not column, it's a uh, post you know, the distillery itself. Oh, yeah. There's no filtration. There is a secondary cask. Um, so that those three factors, they definitely do do big different. Okay. Yeah. So um, it's amazing. I'm, I'm loving that butterscotch. Yeah. That is really amazing. Also, I have, I have to say, you might have lied a little bit because the bottle says Lebanon. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> no, I'm joking. It says Lebanon, so it's Lebanon, Kentucky, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lebanon, Kentucky. Yeah, yeah. Well, they they really really care about you know specify it's Lebanon, Kentucky. Yeah, yeah. I it's, love uh, the yeah. as well. If anyone can see that. Yeah, um, it's like uh, when they say uh, it's Barstown, you know, uh, Kentucky. So yeah, yeah, beautiful, beautiful. I think actually this is um, a lot of people's favorite. So Sorry. this one is actually the new label. Uh, now the old label it used to look like this. Is uh embossed as you can see here. Some mm -hmm. people prefer the old label, but mm. you know, on the back you can't really see, you know. I see, gotcha, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this and, one you know, see, yeah. When you are an ambassador and you want to call for your whiskey, you can't even see it in the back shelf. Uh that's you know, that's a problem. But yeah. Actually, this format here is seven seven fifty, so it wasn't allowed anyway in Europe. Okay, and um, and it goes really well with the chocolate as well, which I don't have any more of. But um, I believe you know this one is going great with chocolate. Um, yeah. yeah, I I have a seventy percent cocoa chocolate here. Oh, amazing. So we've got um, okay. So we've got people saying Terence says number two, number one, number four, number three. Peter said four, one, two, three. Matthew said number two. Keely four, four, two. So it seems to really be between four and two. So actually, the two rise. Yeah. Wow. Well, it's uh, it's surprising on one side. Um, I don't know, you know, if the majority of us are uh, cocktail drinker or just you know a whiskey sipper, uh, but it's really rare to actually find. A ride that is stand up over, uh, you know, whiskey tasting with bourbon. Yeah, yeah. Just because you know, sometimes a rye is just like considered a slap in the face, you know, after really? the sweet yeah, smoothness of yeah, the yeah, bourbon. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. you know, yeah, we we got two rye that are definitely easy to sip. Um, yeah. uh, I I like to call it dangerous, especially minor case. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean. You're absolutely right. When you do a bourbon tasting, you always you might throw in one rye just to mix it up, but knowing that it's going to be the one that people kind of want to steer clear of the most. But actually, it shows you one one the quality of of the rye that you have, and and two that actually you know our customers actually they they do they are they are a little bit more uh, of, of aficion, aficionados, shall I say. Yeah. Um, you know, they, 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 that are just two years old. Yeah, amazing. Oh, uh, that's amazing. Uh, yeah, that's quite something. Honestly, I I'm a big fan of rye, uh, but when I want to sip a rye, I know that I need to put you know, uh, you know, my my hands on my wallet so because rye get expensive when they are you know well aged, yeah. and it's really hard to find a rye that is young and is smooth and is easy to sip by its own. Uh, so this one is definitely, you know, an affordable luxury. You know, it's an everyday ride, and uh, it doesn't it doesn't slap you in the face. It's actually quite smooth, easy, you know. Yeah, and in the early fifties, Mark price point, you know, it's it's a really really good. Um, yeah, it kind of hits all the marks. I think it's that it's that sherry cast that has really made it special, for sure. It is unique, and I've been uh, looking around to find, you know. Um, other whiskey, other rye, they are finished in cream sherry, and they are not. So you know, I believe that there are three unique facts right there. First of all, is uh, you know, one man operation distillery is one barrel a day only, which yeah. is crazy. Um, yeah. 
The second one is, you know, is the beam, is the last beam owning a distillery. Yeah. And the third, you know, is the is the unique special finish that yeah. is, you know, is the only one yeah. using at the moment. It's amazing. I'm, I'm going to try it with a bit of water and see how that goes. Um, but that brings us to the end of our tasting. Mikhail, Michaela, thank you very much. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you for, for having me. I think people have really loved it tonight. Um, there's definitely been a lot of uh, rye as the favourite, so that, that's really good. All these are available in our shop from next week. Um, and just for price points, the Ezra Brooks are coming in the early 30s and the two yellow stones are in the early 50s. Um, so, and, and you also get them at that price as well. Yeah, really good price points. Yeah. So, Michaela, thanks for your time. It's been really Thank good. Guys. Indeed. Uh, I'm sure we're going to have you back again because we'll do some other other stuff with you guys. Um, and so we'll, we'll definitely see you again, for sure. Fantastic. Everyone's saying thank you, by the way. Everyone's, everyone's thank you. Uh, and uh, yeah. if, uh, if anyone have a question, you know, I, I will be happy to, to answer. If I don't have the answer, I can ask the master distillers. And so I get to learn something as well. So please, uh, you know, just uh, just let me know. Um, I, I believe they can get in contact with you, you know, if they if they need any specification. Or I'm uh, uh, Battle Strength in, uh, in Instagram, is, you know, if they want to contact me directly. But it's been absolutely a pleasure. And, uh, yeah, thank you ever so much. Yeah, thank you, Rico. This has been a really informative taste. And I think that's what everyone's saying is that a lot of knowledge and passion there. There's a super Neil comment there. Um, so, yeah, thank you again. Amazing. Uh, thank you as well to everyone for joining us today. Um, always a pleasure. And we thank you, you know, so much for supporting us. Um, so I've just posted there two links for the next uh, couple of whiskey tastings. So we have um, the Glen Goyne uh, and then we have the Emirates at the end of the month. Um, and then we will look at, um, obviously, potentially do another bourbon, bourbon tasting, I think, as well. Um, potentially in August, maybe. Uh, it seems there's a lot of bourbon and rye fans here, so it's definitely one to look at. Um, and potentially, yeah, we might look at doing some cocktails with them because it looks like, um, especially, yeah, with the number four there, I'm very keen to see that as an old fashioned. Um, and actually, maybe maybe we'll try your recipe, Michaela, with the um, the, the, the syrup there. Uh, oh, you know, you can try a Manhattan. They really suggest to try a Manhattan with that, which is beautiful. Um, yeah, yeah. I, again, something that I can suggest uh, the way that I do my Manhattan. I put it in, uh, in, uh, in, in a bottle to actually pre-mix my Manhattan and I try to be good with myself and don't touch it for nine months like a baby. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> when you open that bottle, the smell, it's just uh, 10 times better than any Manhattan that you can do on the spot. It just combines wow. together the ingredient. Uh, it's incredible. I can tell you none of these guys on this tasting are going to wait nine months, I can tell you. <laughs> well, there is, uh, you know, the secret is you just do two boxes of it. So eventually one okay. bottle will make it. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, that's what we have with anyone that comes in trying to collect whiskey. You know, if, if they're fortunate enough, they buy one to have and one to keep because it's really, if you buy one, the chances of that staying on the shelf is not going to work. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, another um, comment there from Matthew. Yeah, uh, glad to have you here for the first time. Yeah, obviously come back for more. Um, you know, like I said, they keep going. Um, Nick. Thank you very much as well again um so yeah any 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 just while we've got uh Michaela here is there anyone that did have a question before we go um i think obviously a lot of people asked throughout the tasting but i'll just double check if no one uh did have anything um no, i think we're good i think we're good so yeah thank you, thank you everyone it's coming, um, up, uh, you know later on i'm always available you know and uh and steam beam for instance uh he it's answering right now some question that we collect on social media. So uh, if you guys have the occasion to go on YouTube, well, with, with their uh, Michele Mixed Matches, you know, just what I put there to store those information. There is two video about the Lux Road Distillery and one about the Limestone Branch Distillery. A uh, short video, about three minutes each, when we collect questions from bartender and, uh, and whiskey lover. Okay. to go directly to the master distiller to answer those questions directly for them. And we are in intention to do that probably, you know, next year as well. So, you know, if, yeah. if you, you might get inspired. Yeah, okay. Yeah. If you have any questions, you can email us as well, and uh, we can certainly pass it on. Uh, Adam Moore is looking forward to this cigar. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you got a cigar on next. Okay, amazing. 
Um, so, and just remember, guys, obviously anyone that orders tonight as well, you get 10% off. Um, so drop us a, a DM on the social media or email, um, and we'll get those bottles uh, in for you at 10% off. Just let us know this evening, uh, and we'll action that for you. Uh, but other than that, thank you to Jess, thank you to Michaela, and um, we will we'll see you guys at the next one. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Michaela. Thank